Thank you. God bless you. What an honor to be back on home turf at Liberty University. Good morning, Liberty University. Woo! Hey, if you've got your Bible, I want you to write uh, a little mark beside two verses. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 8 and 1 Corinthians 15 58. 1 Corinthians 2 8, 1 Corinthians 1558. While you turn to those two passages, let me say what an honor it is to be here. I mean, this is such a thrill. You got to understand what, what a day this is. Uh, I give God all the glory. I walked across this stage, David, to uh, graduate twice and uh, sat in chapel here, now convocation, just like you guys are doing. We heard a lot of speakers years ago back in the day like Josh McDowell and a very young Ravi Zacharias, and it was awesome. Heard Dr. Falwell a lot, and uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about Dr. Falwell and those days of liberty a long time ago before perhaps maybe even some of you guys were born. Um, Liberty uh, changed my life. I mean, it really did. And my wife and I were newlyweds. We'd only been married about three months. We moved to Lynchburg. And David, I want to say how much I appreciate you, and that's very gracious that you uh, that you have reached out to me. And we've got a friendship. He speaks at an event we do called Truth for a New Generation. It's an apologetics event that I really started when I was a student at Liberty. I was a youth pastor while I was going to school. And way back in 1991, a long time ago, we started Truth Truth for a New Generation, and it was an apologetics event, and we, we do it to this day, and one of our, our staff and board members is here, a guy named John Folsom. Everybody say, hi, John. Glad John is here. By the way, uh, we, um, huh, we have been in a lot of states to do events, not only to evangelize people, but really to equip the church to defend the faith. And I got to tell you, when I was at Liberty back in the day, Liberty had just crested 3,000 people. And now there's like that many every, you know, street of the campus now. But it was an exciting place, and I want to paint a little bit of a picture Uh, about the liberty that I attended. And then I want to tell you three life, well, four really, four life-changing principles that that I got here that drive me to this day because they they were really, really impactful. And as I share these, I want to say with all my heart what an honor it is to be here because I look around this room and you guys are, I know you hear this. I know you probably hear this a lot, but you guys and gals, y'all are the life changers, the world changers of the 21st century. Uh, Of anything I'll do all year, and the Lord has blessed me, um, I give God the praise. Traveling, speaking, I speak at about 25 or 30 colleges a year, mostly secular schools, to do debates, to present the gospel, defend the faith. Um, A lot of media that God's allowed me to do, uh, um, like Fox News and CNN and a lot of interviews where I know I'm the only Christian in the room a lot of times, and that's an honor to do that. But I want to tell you, there's not one engagement, not one opportunity all year that means more to me than this one right here today. And I thank God for this school, but I thank God for each and every one of you all, because God has a plan and a purpose for each one of your lives. And the Lord has a destiny, a pathway for you, and things that you will do that will count for eternity for all of eternity. So what I want to do is share four things that really God uh, engraved in my heart and my soul while I was at Liberty because they drive me to this day, and I pray that they might be uh, fairly significant to you. I'll tell you a little bit about how I came to Liberty. Um, I got saved when I was 21. I was attending University of North Carolina at Greensboro and came to the Lord at 21. Yay, Greensboro. (laughs) And uh, I was invited to a Monday night Bible study. I started going to this Bible study, and I have to tell you, I had kind of ulterior motives. I had not seen the light, and I wasn't looking for the switch. Uh, I went to this Bible study because there were some girls there, and one in particular that I was interested in. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. But I got under conviction, and I found Jesus, and I got saved, and I began to grow in the Lord, and I began to try to witness to my college friends about the Lord. Well, anyway, about three and a half, four years into my Christian walk, I 
felt God called me to the ministry. And so I began to pray about where to go to school. Now, this was the late 1980s, and Liberty wasn't all that well known back then. And there were a lot of schools around, and not all of them as solidly biblical as they probably should have been. But I went to a school that was not too far from my house, and it was a place where I could do a master's degree, perhaps. And so we're talking, they said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to get equipped to preach the Bible and lead people to Christ and defend the faith. I want to do apologetics, because I had gotten into apologetics. Josh McDowell and uh, a lot of the professors I would later sit under, like Gary Habermas here and Dave Beck and the great apologist that poured into my life. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm at the school. And, and the person asked me, they said, do you believe in Noah and the flood? I said, uh, yeah. And they said, well, we don't believe that here. And if you believe in the flood and all that, you know, Genesis is kind of a myth. You just might not do very well here, so you might want to think about another school. And I was really bummed out because I'm thinking, wow, how could you be a Christian college and not believe in the Bible? Listen to this true story. I wish I could adequately convey this. But I go home one night, Sunday night, late after church, and it's about 10 o'clock at night, and I turn on the television. And at that point, I'm living with my parents still, 24 years old, still living at home. But, uh, I was engaged, going to get married, move out. But I get home late at night, go up to my room, turn on the television, and there's this guy. And he looks in the camera. He goes, young man, has God called you to preach? I said, uh, yeah. He goes, would you like to go to a school where every professor is a born-again, Bible-believing Christian? Is that the kind of school you want to go to? I was like, Yes. Yes, it is. And I'm listening. I'm, I'm really hooked. And he's talking about Liberty University, and you can become a champion for Christ. And I'm thinking, wow. And listen, he says, at Liberty, they have all these degrees, and he's naming off business and education and pre-law and all these things. And then he goes, Apollo. I was like, wow, apologetics. I ran downstairs. I woke up my mom and dad. My parents were asleep. I said, I know where I'm going to go to school. They said, where? I said, Lynchburg, Virginia. My dad said, where is that? I said, I don't know, but I'm going there. I mean, nothing could have kept me away. And I want to tell you, it was everything that I dreamed of, prayed for, times 10, really. I don't know if you know all these names, but listen, I thank God, and this relates to my first scripture, I thank God for Elmer Towns, with whom I wrote two books who was one of my professors. I thank God for Gary Habermas, who taught us about the resurrection. And I don't know if you know this, is the world expert on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, Biblical Archaeology Review, which is not the world's most conservative magazine, calls Habermas the world expert on the resurrection and ancient evidence for the life of Christ. And I sat under these professors. Uh, back then, Norm Geisler was here, one of the world's preeminent apologist, and the man that preached my ordination, the Bible teacher, was Dr. Harold Wilmington, amazing man of God. Now think about this, because 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says this, and this relates to every one of us, our call. Uh, Paul says, we not only imparted to you the gospel of our God, but our very lives also, because you had become dear to us. Every one of us, God has a call on our life to, yes, impart the gospel. We tell people about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, the gospel, the good news. But we impart our lives to people. And you all are here as people who came before us, laid down their very lives to carve this university out of the mountain. Dr. Falwell, most notably, but so many people. And I will tell you, the years I was here, it was like there was one long revival and prayer meeting. It was just uh, something tangible in the air, and I'm sure it still is. I think about Dr. Wilmington. Okay, while I was here at Liberty, my dad got cancer, and uh, I, I put him on the prayer list. A couple of classes, I'm like, hey, pray for my dad, he might die. Anyway, my mom and dad called me one day from Greensboro, 120 miles away. And I'm like, uh, what's going on? They said, hey, the nicest man from Liberty was just here to pray for us. He came to the hospital room, the nicest man from Liberty. I said, oh yeah, who was that? Doc, uh, I think his name was Dr. Harold Wilmington. I'm thinking, wow, what college, a national world-class university where the VP would go 120 miles to pray for some student's dad? 
Isn't that amazing? But see, at Liberty, uh, this was what we watched in all of those leaders, and I know it's this, the case even still, that they imparted not only the gospel, but their very lives. And we're here today, and I, I hope, and I know I'm, I'm going to sound like a grown-up here, I'm probably going to sound like your parents, but, but really, really, thank God, thank God that you can be at a university where not only is the Lord honored, not only is His Word recognized, but there are people that really understand this is not a job, it's a calling. You as a student, view this as a calling. Hey, I had a professor, I don't know if he's still here, I'll never forget, uh, a professor whose name was Denton McCainy, and he, he gave me a little nugget that changed my student career. He said, as you walk in the door of every class, as you walk through that door, just tell yourself, I'm going to make an A in this class as a worship offering for God. I used to do that. I came here as a, a C student on a good day, and I used to do what he said. I was like, okay, Lord, help me to make a, a worship offering, because, you know, all of life is stewardship. First Corinthians uh, uh, says that we're not owners, we're managers. And you know what? I began to get A's because I viewed it as an opportunity to give God a worship offering by trying to do my best in school. But, but let me share some things that God laid on my heart. But first, I'll give you 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And this relates to all of you. Because not all are going to be in ministry as in pastoring or missionary. I know some of you will be, praise God. But a lot of you are going to be in business or education or medicine or the sciences or IT or web or law, politics, the judiciary, the arts. You know, wherever God is leading you, know this, believe it that you can make a mark for the gospel. You really, really can. I mean, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 is talking about the resurrection of Christ. And it says that Jesus rose from the dead. He was seen by uh, Peter and the disciples, 500 bre brethren at once. The, the resurrection is the theme of 1 Corinthians 15. But then the chapter concludes, oh, I love this. It says, therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What you do for Christ is not in vain. Every, every word, every seed you sow, every prayer you pray, uh, learning what you're going to learn, you may today in your classroom ingest something that the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance a decade from now. You never know. And I would beg and I would urge you, as you're here at Liberty getting your education, really soak in every day, every lecture. Um, this is the training ground that if you handle it well, will propel you for the, the trajectory of your life, honestly. And so your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Uh, we, we understand, you know, leading a, a small group or going on a mission trip or preaching a sermon, that's service for the Lord. I would submit to you being a, an A student or the best student you can be or, or doing your best in the research and all the learning and attending to the stewardship of the mind, that is labor for the Lord that is not in vain as well. And so some principles were, were imparted to us back in the day. Now, I, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, after Dr. Falwell went to be with the Lord back in uh, 2007, um, I don't know if you know that much about Dr. Falwell and the history of the school, but um, I wrote an article that ran on a lot of the wire services. In fact, some people email me, some thumbs up, some thumbs down. But I wrote an article about the things I learned from Dr. Falwell. And he was, he was the awesomest guy. I mean, he really was. I know uh, you probably have heard of him as, you know, the founder of the school, the pastor of Thomas Road Baptist Church. But he was really a fun guy. I mean, he really was. I'll never forget one Wednesday night after church. We stopped at the Kroger on uh, Wards Road, if it's still there, I don't know. Anyway, I'm, I'm like a pretty big guy, uh, five, seven and a half and 175 pounds. Anyway, we're in the Kroger and some arm comes around behind me, picks me up. The dude picks me up like a, a, a suitcase. And I said, Dr. Falwell, you're going to break your back. And he, you know, hits me on the shoulder and he says, ha, 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 you know. He would always say stuff like this. He would say, put an end to the monkey business or I'm going to put an end to the monkeys, you know. And he sat me down. He was really a fun guy. And he was a guy that did not let it get under his skin when people were critical of him. 
in the, in the newspaper and in the media, because he stood for Jesus Christ, pe- people could be very critical. And one of the things he would say in chapel here, he would say, the short road to bitterness is paved by taking every little injustice to heart. So he would say, you know, just love people, pray for people, love your enemies, pray for your enemies. And he was an amazing person. We were watching him, and uh, he, the way he would, would show love even to people that didn't show love to him. I'll tell you something else about Dr. Falwell, and we're here today enjoying the fruits of his obedience. Um, he was really transparent and open about the needs of the school. Now, now, as I said, when I got to Liberty, Liberty had 3,000 students. So Dr. Falwell would come to chapel sometimes and he would say, well, we need to pray because we're $11 million in debt and uh, if we don't have a half million dollars within the next 48 hours, you know, the bank is going to come and close us down, but that's not going to happen because of Philippians 1.6 that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. I mean, listen to this. Jerry Falwell served a big God. Jerry Falwell served a God that answered prayer. He believed in a God who would faithfully carry you through the calling that had been assigned to you. And that God is still God. That, that God, listen, this morning you might be here and you might be thinking about how you're going to pay your tuition. Or you might have a lot of burdens about something going on back home. And you might have a lot of stuff in life. I hate to break it to you. Even as Christians, you know, we got more baggage than Samsonite, okay? You know, stuff happens. Christianity is not the subtraction of all your problems, but it is the addition of Jesus through all of the valleys of life. Hallelujah. He will never leave you or forsake you. And, and I used to watch Dr. Falwell, and I would think, how could he shoulder the burden of this university and not just implode? And if you ever saw him out in public, I mean, he was always so sunshiny and happy, and uh, he always remembered my name, and he would remember people's names. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But I asked Elmer Towns one time, I asked Dr. Towns, I said, did you ever see Dr. Falwell discouraged? He said, never. In all those years of all that time and the pressure, uh, and here we are today, literally, because of what God did through a lot of people, but namely, the, the, the point man. And Elmer Town said, he asked Dr. Falwell once, uh, did you ever get discouraged? And Dr. Falwell smiled and said, not on the outside. Inside of his heart, he was trusting Jesus, and you can trust Jesus. Listen, regarding the resurrection, hey, don't you know if Jesus went to the cross, paid the sin debt of the world, shouldered all of our guilt and all of our pain, and if Jesus would love us enough to lay down our life to give us heaven, don't you know he cares about your financial state? Your, your family, your needs, where you are on the journey, of course he does. And so liberty was an amazing place, I mean it really was. And I want to share with you just some things that I picked up along the journey. And you know, God's been good to me, I give God the glory, um, preaching, writing, everything I've ever dreamed of, of trying to do, God has allowed me to pursue. And we've seen souls saved and we've been in thousands of locations in the last 22 years. But listen to this. God has a plan for you, honestly. And and I would beg and plead that you would make the decision while you're here at Liberty, and maybe even today, that in your heart, maybe, maybe somehow a switch would flip, and you would say, Lord, I want to be that person. I want to be the one who doesn't just dabble in the walk of, of Jesus. I want to be what God called me to be. Because here's the deal. Here's the deal. Um, We don't just get heaven uh, in in our salvation. I mean, we get the chance to live a life down here that really will count for eternity. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Okay, tomorrow, tomorrow is the day we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. David mentioned it. And you know, uh, Luther, praise God, we're here today thanks to the obedience of Martin Luther. The door of the church at Wittenberg. He nails that 95 thesis, salvation by faith, not works, yay, and here we are. Okay, we ought to 
equally celebrate those other great leaders like Dr. Falwell, the ones who've imparted to you, the people who told you about Jesus. Those are the people also that one day around the throne in heaven we're going to celebrate with. And we're here like 1 Thessalonians 2.8. Not only they shared the gospel, but they imparted their very lives. Now listen to this. Number one, I'm going to give you four thoughts as we wrap up. Number one, view the Great Commission with a sense of personal involvement. View the Great Commission with a sense of personal investment. Really. I mean, we, we know a great missionary, a youth pastor, somebody who touched us, God is going to use them. But listen, God is going to use you. He will. View the Great Commission with a sense of having some skin in the game. Lord, use me. Father, cleanse me, fill me, send me, use me. God wants to do things in your life and through your life that will count for eternity. View the Great Commission with a sense of personal investment. Number two, follow Jesus even at the risk of being misunderstood. See, here's the deal. Sometimes if you really come out bold for Jesus and you get all about walking with the Lord and serving the Lord, sometimes people are not going to understand, even those very close to you. Sometimes family members, come on, hey, come, just move on back and, and you can finish up at, you know, a local school. And really? I mean, you, you were going to be a business major and make money, and now God's called you to missions. You really want to do that? Oftentimes, well-meaning but misguided people close to us will try to get us to compromise. Sometimes Satan will try to get you to compromise morally, and you'll do things that you know are sinful, and you, you need to turn back from that and say, Lord, cleanse me. Follow Jesus even at the risk of being misunderstood. And I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. Sometimes following Jesus involves having to jettison some relationships that are negative in our life. And remember, friend, remember that we are to live our lives for the one who gave his life for us. Follow Jesus even at the risk of being misunderstood. Number three, I learned at Liberty that the limitations of the sheep are overcome by the power of the shepherd. Hey. Jesus is able. Like I said, if He can rise from the dead, He can meet your needs. Uh, one of the things about liberty was, in the, back in those days, it's not that way now. I mean, liberty's got more money than, than uh, you know, Fort Knox now probably. But back in the day when I was here, I mean, really, uh, one of my pastors that mentored me back in North Carolina, he said, you don't want to go to liberty. I mean, uh, a four-year degree, they're probably not going to be open in four years. Uh, well, God knows what He's doing. The limitations of our lives are eclipsed by the unlimited love and power and wisdom of the one who created the universe and conquered the grave. You know what? I, I think about uh, all that God has done and all that God wants to do in every one of your lives, and trust Jesus. He knows your name. He loves you. He's with you. He'll never forsake you. I love Matthew 6, verse eight that says, the Father knows what you need even before you ask. Think about that for just a minute, that the Father knows what you need even before you ask. So the limitations of the sheep are met and even eclipsed by the power of the shepherd. Number four, know this, that before the prize, there comes a price. I mean, think about it. The world's largest Christian university and respected, accredited, world-renowned, really. But I'm telling you, there were decades of blood, sweat, and tears that gave us this. I mean, we really are the beneficiaries of, of the, the sacrifice of a lot of great people that came before us, not the least of whom was Dr. Falwell. But there's a prize, uh, short-term and long-term. Maybe the short-term uh, brass ring that you are reaching for is to finish the semester, get a project done. Uh, make a grade, pass a class, complete a status sheet, great. And then you've got to find out how to do next semester. And then you want to graduate. Listen, remember every day, every 24-hour period is a gift from God, really. And God has blessings for you. Oh my goodness, the Lord has so much for you. But to realize all of those prizes like a degree a career, building a family, making a mark for Jesus, um, doing whatever God has put on your heart, you're going to have to, listen, you're going to have to love the process as much as the end result. 
Now the end result, writing a book, achieving your goal, that's a great end result. But if you're going to make it, if you're going to go the distance, you've got to embrace the process, even as much as you embrace the end result. And what is the process? It's not glitzy and glamorous. You know, walking across the stage two times when I graduated, that was great. James Dobson was the commencement speaker, went to work for Dr. Dobson. I know the school has a partnership with Dr. Dobson. Hey, it's great, the graduation day where you have the degree, but you, you got to remember those successes and those accomplishments are built and are very much contingent upon every day that you embrace the process, which can mean hard work and study. And, and listen, you got to understand it. Many of us settle for adequate when God has called us to excellence. And so the prize, I want you to for a moment think about the ultimate prize. When we see the Lord one day, and we're all going to see Jesus one day, we're all going to stand before the Lord. I, um, I love Hebrews 9.27 that says, it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Because that's a wake-up call. I mean, think about it. You have a date with your own mortality, and God knows when it is. We, it's kind of morbid, we don't like to think about it, but you're going to leave this world one day, you really are. And you need to be prepared, and every day is a time, number one, if you don't know Christ, God's call for you is to open your heart and to become a believer. So if you're here today and you've never, never trusted Jesus, or maybe if you're watching online, listen, Jesus Christ is as close by as a prayer. And so number one, have you trusted Christ and been born again? And if you haven't done that, I know that this would be the optimum time. You may never have this opportunity to say, Lord, save me. I want you to know God loves you. He, God loves you. He's not mad at you. And, and he, He's not just waiting to drop the heaven's hammer on you. If you will turn to Him, He'll forgive whatever you've done. He can heal whatever's been done to you. So number one, turn to Christ. Uh, but think about the day you'll stand before God in terms of your service. I, I want to say this, I wrote this in a notebook while I was at Liberty, that I want to, listen, we're not saved by works, but I wanted everything post-salvation to be a decades-long thank you note back to Jesus. Today, how can you be working on that thank you note back to Jesus? And there'll be a prize one day when you face the Lord and He says, well done, good job, enter into the joy of the Lord. First Corinthians 15, 58 is right, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The things you do for Christ count for eternity, and you have no idea, you have no clue the lives that your life is touching. See Christianity is life on life transference, I mean it really is, life on life transference. I want to share a quote. And I, I want to challenge you, number one, to know the Lord. Number two, to let Jesus really do the driving in your life. And don't limit yourself. Don't aim too low. Don't quit too soon. You've got more that God has for you to do than you can possibly imagine, really. And what you do in life and for Christ counts. Listen to this. C.S. Lewis. I love C.S. Lewis. Do we have any C.S. Lewis fans here? One, two, okay, everybody. By the way, it is God's will that you read C.S. Lewis, you don't even have to pray about it. But C.S. Lewis was interviewed in 1954, oh I love this quote, it stirs my heart, check it out. Somebody asked C.S. Lewis, the great scholar, um, all this talk about the end of time, Jesus coming back. Lewis, do you believe that? Do you believe Jesus is coming back? Here's what he said, and I, I share this as we close as a way of a challenge to myself and to all of us. C.S. Lewis said this, listen, he said, indeed, the curtain on the stage of history has already fallen, and we believers know how the story ends. We know that Christ is coming back, and time as we know it will one day come to a close. But that does not absolve us of the responsibility to faithfully carry out our God-given tasks on a daily basis. For some of us, our calling in life is to feed the animals on a farm. And others are called to plan some great campaign that may benefit history a hundred years from now. Listen to what Lewis said. He said, deep in our heart we know Christ is coming back, time will come to an end, the animals may not get fed, and our great plans for tomorrow may never come to fruition. But it didn't matter, 
said Lewis. The important thing was this. We were at our post when the inspection came. That's powerful. When King Jesus comes to inspect the troops, let's be at our post for him, whatever that assignment might have been. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's bow our heads. As I turn it over to David here in just a moment, can we just take a second and really open our heart to God? And again, if you are unsure of your salvation, call on Jesus today and and receive His forgiveness and love. If you are a believer and you just want to say, Lord, I am on the team 100%. Lord, cleanse me, fill me, send me, use me. Whatever decision God is calling you to do, to repent of a sin, to recommit to your, your mission. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you that not only can we share truth, but our lives can touch other lives, and lives shape us. And Lord, make, make us grateful, not only for Jesus, but for all of His big family that's around us, influencing our life. And so, Lord, I pray for this school, for every student here, every faculty and staff, and everybody that is this great big thing called Liberty University. May the Spirit of God fill us. May the Spirit of God empower us. May the Spirit of God guide us and lead us and fill us and use us. And Lord Jesus, I pray that one day in heaven there would be millions there who found the Lord and met the Savior because of what you do through the lives of these people. In Jesus' name and for His glory. And his soon coming kingdom we pray, amen.